let's finish this chapter out with a little bit of information about cell signaling, how cells can signal each other, provide information to each other. Four different types of cell communication styles depends on the cells that we're talking about, which one of these mechanisms they would employ. Some cells have direct connections uh, called gap junctions, which allow signals to be passed directly. Literally, molecules could be passed from one cell to an adjacent cell through this special channel called a gap junction. So that would be a very direct form of cell communication. Paracrine signaling, this is a type of signaling that involves cells that are nearby, but perhaps not in direct contact with each other, and maybe they're just kind of in the same vicinity as each other. And essentially what happens is one cell would secrete a molecule, and then diffusion would be sufficient to carry that molecule over um, to another cell. The molecule would diffuse through the extracellular spaces and eventually reach some target cell that's not too far away. That's a lot of times called local signaling. This happens within a given organ a lot of times. So a cell within an organ might need to send some information to another nearby cell to kind of spread the information around this way by paracrine signaling. Uh, relies on diffusion. And then we have synaptic signaling next. This is the type of signaling that neurons use, nerve cells use, and this involves the release of a molecule called a neurotransmitter. We're going to be seeing this in much more detail coming up shortly. That neurotransmitter is the signal molecule. It would get released and diffusion would carry it over through a very short distance to some sort of a target cell. It could be a muscle cell or it could be another neuron. Finally, last type of signaling, general signaling mechanism here is endocrine signaling. Endocrine means that this involves the bloodstream. So what would happen here is there would be something that gets secreted from a gland, something is produced and secreted into the bloodstream. Uh, that thing that gets secreted into the bloodstream and gets carried along, that's called a hormone. A hormone is just a, a messenger molecule. It travels through the blood. So um, since it's traveling through the bloodstream, it can reach a number of different target cells throughout the body. That's endocrine signaling. So kind of a key theme here that's coming up with all of these is this concept of a signal being sent and then another cell receiving that signal. So um, how the signal is received by, um, by the receiving cell is often through a receptor protein. So let's take a look at what are some possibilities for, uh, for receiving the signal. How do cells do this? Target cells, in other, one, in other words, the ones that are receiving the signal, um, these are cells that have special proteins that can recognize that signal. And these are called receptor proteins. There are a couple of different options for where receptor proteins could be located. They could be located directly in the plasma membrane, and they just kind of hang out there and wait for signals to arrive. These are the types of receptors that would receive signals um, if the signal is perhaps a large molecule or if it is a very polar molecule. In other words, if it's a signal that cannot cross the plasma membrane, um, then its receptor protein, shown in green here, would be in the plasma membrane. That's where it has to be in order to be able to receive the signal. On the other hand, if the signal molecule is nonpolar, uh, that would imply that it's able to cross the plasma membrane. So in that case, the signal molecule might actually diffuse through directly across the plasma membrane, and its receptor could actually be inside of the cell. So those are two different styles of, of receiving signals. It depends on the signal molecule itself. What type of chemical molecule is it? Um, in any case, once the signal binds to the receptor, Usually there would be a cascade of events that happens internally, inside of the cell. So it could be some sort of a signaling cascade that ends up modifying gene expression in the nucleus. Um, in the case of, let's jump back over to this one, in the case of a signal molecule that binds a receptor in the plasma membrane, then um, these receptors, they're fixed in place. They're in the plasma membrane. So how are they going to influence what's going on in the nucleus? A lot of times there would be what's called a second messenger involved. So this receptor protein would then activate a second messenger 
and the second messenger would go and influence something inside of the cell. It could be gene expression or it could be some other process that takes place. So this is something we will be encountering in more detail as we go forward. Uh, but just to plant the idea right now, this is a good opportunity to introduce some of the basics of this. Let's look at how second messengers might function, how they might be able to do what they do. The example we're going to walk through here is going to involve something called a G protein. It's called a G protein because its energy source is GTP instead of ATP. Um, but anyway, G proteins, let's take a look at how a G protein would function. I'm going to just point to our schematic over here. I think this is a, a really good one for getting the concept across. So what we're starting with is some type of a signal molecule right here in purple. And that signal molecule binds to its receptor, which is embedded in the plasma membrane. In order for that receptor to initiate some sort of a change inside of the cell, Oftentimes the way that it would do that is through the action of a G protein. So the G protein is shown in green. Notice it has three subunits, alpha, beta, and gamma. No, this one's alpha, this one's beta, this one's gamma. And what happens when this receptor binds the signal? Um, there's gonna be some sort of a perhaps shape change or something takes place in this receptor that will then activate the G protein. So once the G protein is activated, it uses again a molecule of GTP, and then what happens is these subunits slide apart from each other. They physically move apart. And once they are separated, uh, the alpha subunit and the beta and gamma subunits, they can actually move. They can diffuse, they can move throughout the plasma membrane, slide around to different places, and go and do things. So in this case, the beta and gamma subunits are diffusing through the plasma membrane. They go over and they find some other molecule to bind to, and that other molecule is what we would call an effector. This is the one that is going to cause some type of a change inside of the cell. So once the G protein activates the effector, then the effector might start some sort of a chemical reaction taking place. It could be an enzyme that becomes activated. Um, so that would start some sort of a signaling cascade inside of the cell. And it's possible that both the beta and gamma and alpha subunits could separately could like cause two different things to happen. That is totally possible. There's a variety of mechanisms that G proteins can activate. In the end, once they've done their job, the subunits of the G protein come back together. They slide back together, get all connected back up, and now here they are hanging out with the receptor protein again. So we'll elaborate on this in more detail in future chapters. For right now, just getting the general concept of G proteins and kind of um, as a means of initiating second messenger systems. That's kind of the point we need to be at right now in the general context of cell signaling.